standing as we listen to the words of Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. One day as Jesus was standing, standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and I haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, this summer, uh, we are doing something a little differently than we, I would say, normally do around here as far as preaching. We're not in a series. During this summer, each week, there's going to be a different passage of Scripture and a different message. I think it allows people to go off on vacation and come back and not feel lost uh, because they're in week three of a series. And so um, today, I invite you, if you will, grab your worship guide. Just turn to the back. We always provide a message outline. And you'll find your message outline there, and I would encourage you to grab a pen or a pencil on the seat back in front of you there, and to take some notes today as we study God's Word. It's summertime, and um, I want to share a real quick story with you. Uh, the, the, doesn't the choir look good, by the way? Did you notice how good they look? And they sounded good, right? You guys do look good. You look all bright and cheery. I want to tell you, the choir last summer did me really wrong. Um... I showed up here new, green, didn't know anything about this place, and wore a robe all summer long. I was burning up, burning up, burning up. It was hot. And we got to the end of the summer, and I think it was Jim Burdick that said to me, you know we take the summer off to be casual. You didn't have to wear that robe all summer long. <laughs> I said, why didn't somebody tell me? So, hey, I'm glad to be... Uh, a little bit different in the summer. We're going to be a little different even in, uh, in, in what we do each week. I, I've been thinking a lot about this particular scripture we're going to study today. Luke chapter 5. I've got it there in front of you. Or you might be able to pull up your Bible or your tablet, read whatever translation you want to. It's a very familiar story. But I've been thinking a lot about this story and I've been thinking a lot about obedience. At the heart of what I want to talk to you about today from this scripture is obedience and it's really about being a follower how 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 do followers obey how are we supposed to act now we call followers of jesus what disciples right and this story from luke chapter 5 that we're going to study today is the beginning of jesus's ministry jesus is going to be calling some people to go with him to do the work that god called him to do the father called him to do and so just as jesus is starting out He's going to have an interaction with people. He's not going to choose his disciples quickly. He's going to take some time. But before we kind of reread the scripture that Howard already read for us today, I want you to think for yourself for a moment about how Jesus chose his disciples. He didn't send out a sign-up sheet and say, well, if you want to self-select, you can do that. right?" He didn't let his disciples self-select. He, he didn't hold some type of election or politic for his disciples. 
If you pay close attention what Jesus actually did with every one of the disciples was had some moment of engagement, some moment of interaction with them to find out something about them. And then he chose 12. Today, we're going to begin with the first three, right? Peter, James, and John. We're going to hear their story. But that engagement where Jesus learns something about them and how they respond, that's what we want to pay attention to today. As a matter of fact, I'm going to call them the test of followership. I'm going to talk to you about some tests that we see go on in this very passage that these disciples, especially Peter to begin with, but the others, they're going to have to pass the test if they're going to become his followers. But what I want to suggest to you is that their story is our story. And that those very same tests of fellowship are the tests that we face on a routine basis about how we would be followers of Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus, here's some tests that he's going to take us through. So let's dive in. It's a, it's a familiar passage for the most part. Luke chapter 5, the Bible says it this way. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Let's just pause there for a minute. What in the world is the lake of Gennesaret? Well, I think you're aware there's a big body of water in northern Israel that we call the Sea of Galilee. But the Sea of Galilee goes by a bunch of names. Sometimes it's called the Lake of Gennesaret. Sometimes it's called the Sea of Tiberias. Jesus is at the Sea of Galilee. And Luke just happens to use a different name for it. This is where he does 80% of his ministry. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And so Jesus is there. It says, one day Jesus was standing by the Lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. If you want to see this story, here's what's happening. The longer Jesus talks, the more people show up. Now, that's not like me. The longer I talk, the more the fewer the crowd gets, right? But the, the longer Jesus talks, a crowd is forming so much so that he sees the water and he comes up with this idea to get out on the water. Water is a natural vocal amplifier, and that's what he's going to do. So the Bible says uh, about those crowds, it says they were listening to the word of God and he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. You might want to underline that word Simon. Who is this? Well, this is the person we would come to know as Peter. His name changes later on. Jesus changes his name. But Simon is not a disciple yet, right? And it's this person that we will come to know as this massive disciple of Jesus called Peter. And he's having his first encounter. So the Bible goes on. Then Jesus sat down. He taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Hey, can I just pause for a minute? I, I want you to notice the first one was a question. He said, he asked, can we put out into the water? But I want you to notice the second time he talks to Simon after speaking to him, it's a command. He tells him, put out in the deep water and let's drop the nets. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full they began to sink. Now, if you're really going to get this scripture, you've got to imagine how many fish they are taking on. These are professional fishermen, but they've never seen anything like this. The boat is filling up with fish and the boat is going under the water. That much weight is coming in to the boat. Are you getting the picture? This is something else. And you, you cannot miss this. In this moment, Jesus is using this moment to engage with these men and find out something about them. The Bible goes on, it says, When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's business partners, if you will, right? And then it says, then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. 
From now on you will catch men. And so they pulled their boats up on the shore. They left everything and they followed him. Before I talk to you and get you to fill in some blanks and underline some things, I just want to just pause for a minute and just point out something about this scripture. Jesus could have asked Simon to get out of the boat, hopped in the boat and taken it out by himself, dropped anchor and talked. Jesus was familiar with water. He could have done it all by himself. He could have, he could have just taken off. And, but I want you to note something. That's not the way Jesus works. Jesus then and now uses people to accomplish his work. And so today as we talk about a follower or a disciple or whatever you want to call the people who follow Jesus, you've got to get the picture of what God wants. God is always interested in using people to advance the kingdom. Jesus uses people over and over. and he's, So you've got to get that picture. And that has a huge impact on you and I. He wants to use us. But the question is, are we going to pass the tests? You got your pen? Let's notice a few tests that go on in this short passage, all right? And the first test, I, I call it the, the bias for action test. Write that down. The bias for action test. So Jesus noticed, he, Jesus doesn't stand by his boat. The Bible says that Jesus climbed into the boat and he looks at Peter and he says, he asks him, can we put out? Can we put out a little bit from shore? Now in this moment, Peter has options. Simon has options. He can look at him and he can say, Hey, you go. I'm cleaning the nets. I'll pull them out here. I'll let you go by yourself, right? He could have said, how about this? There's a boat sitting right there. Go use that one. Go, go take that one on, right? He could have pointed him to a different boat. He could have looked at him and he said, I'm tired. I've been fishing all night long. No, 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 no. I'm washing the nets. But Peter, Simon, has a bias for action. We learn about this all through the scriptures, but just in this moment, notice when Jesus says, can we, can we set out a little bit? Peter's going to move. Peter's going to go. This is how he's wired. In your margin, you might want to even write down these words. He is action-oriented. This is who Peter is. He's not, he's not got a bias for delay. All right? That's not what he has. He has a bias for action. He's going to take off. By the way, can I pause here for just a moment? You may or may not know this about uh, your leadership in this church and our staff here in this church, but one of our jobs is to help disciples get engaged in the ministry of Jesus. And do you know what kind of people we're looking for? People who have a bias for, what's that word? Action. What? Action. Action. We want people to say, put me in, coach, let's go. Let me say that a little differently. You know, it's, it's, it's not a lot of fun to have to wind somebody up, right? To, to get them to go, go, go. We want people who say, hey, let's go, let's go. And by the way, don't you want to be a part of a church where everybody is saying, let's go? What does God have for us? A bias for action. By the way, the, <laughs> Peter, this is, you, he, he does this over and over again. Jesus is walking on the water. Eleven of them stay in the boats, right? Who gets out? Starts walking on the water. That's right. Peter, he's got a bias for action. Maybe you remember the Garden of Gethsemane. They come to arrest Jesus. You remember what Peter did, right? Took the sword off. He's going to fight, right? Cuts the guy's ears off. By the, by the way, let me pause here for a moment. Whenever somebody has a bias for action, they're going to make mistakes. <laughs> they're going to cross lines. They're going to jump boundaries they're not supposed to cross. But I can tell you as a pastor, I'd rather do a course correction with somebody who's moving than try to get somebody from a stalled position, right? It's okay. It's okay if people go out there and make mistakes. Even with Simon, the ear is cut off. What does Jesus do? Jesus covers over his mistake. Jesus is looking, I think, for a person of action. And, and I dare say that if Peter that day, Simon that day, had said, no, you can't use my boat, you wouldn't know his name, and he wouldn't have a story. Because there, the test was, will you go with me? Will you go with me? Will you go? Bias for action. 
Now, this today, in every one of these tests, I've given you a little scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I just want to invite you to take your pen and say, how am I doing at that? Am I a person of action? And when God says go, do I delay? Do I debate? Do I argue? Or do I go? Am I a person with a bias for action? And by the way, I really mean that. Don't sit here and look at me. Rate yourself, okay? And don't peek at your neighbor's paper. That ain't nothing. That ain't none of your business, right? How do you rate yourself at this test of followership? Well, the first test I think that's going on here, I would call it the bias for action test. Now, here's another one. Write this one down. The next test I see here, I call it the will you follow direction test. Will you follow direction? Because you know what's going to happen, right? They get out in the boat, they're on the water, and it's time for Jesus. He finishes up his teaching. He looks over at Simon, and he gives him a command. He says, what? He said, I want you to put out into the deep water, and I want you to drop the nets. Now, you know, you know he's been cleaning the nets. This is a request to go into the deep water, muddy back up the nets again, and... Will you follow direction is the big moment. And the question is, is he going to obey? It's not a question this time. It's a, it's a command. Put out into the deep water and drop the nets. Now, if we're honest, really honest, Peter struggles here. Peter does not want to do this. Matter of fact, he even says it. He says, Master, notice three things he says. He says, we've worked hard. How long? All night, number two, right? And then he says, um, what was the third one? Uh, we haven't caught anything, thank you. And we haven't caught anything. He's got reasons that he doesn't want to go, okay? But if you got your pen, underline the seven words, the seven words that really matter. But because you say so, I will. But because you say so, I will. So Peter's wrestling. He's struggling. But what happens in the end? He lands it. He, land, he passes the test because he obeys. Guys, I, I want to tell you that <laughs> I think it's okay to be honest sometimes when we feel like God's calling us to do something we're uncomfortable with. I think it's okay to wrestle. The big thing is, will you land well? And will you say, but because you say so, I will. You know, Peter, this isn't the, this isn't the last time Peter's going to wrestle. Peter goes on to lead the church in Jerusalem. He leads this, this ragtag bunch of disciples. He goes on and writes letters that, 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 that end up in our New Testament canon. But he struggles and wrestles with Gentiles coming into the church. And you remember the Cornelius vision and all of that. This isn't the last time he's going to wrestle. But the key is, now listen, I want to say it one more time. If he would have not obeyed here, I don't think you'd know who Peter is. If he would have said, no, we fished all night long, we're tired, we didn't catch anything. No, I'm not dirty enough, my nets. Now, what I want you to catch here before we leave test number two is Peter cannot see the stakes. He doesn't know if he says no at this moment how everything else is going to change. But you and I, we have the, we have the whole story. And we can see that one simple lack of obedience would have changed everything. But because you say so, I will, results in a totally different follower named Simon Peter. And what I want to suggest to you is that about every day you take this test. About every day God's got something that he commands you to do, tells you to do. And you, like me, you can't see the stakes either. You don't know how it's going to impact your family. You don't know how it's going to impact another life. You can't see the stakes either. The, so the question is, will you, even if you wrestle, will you land it well? But because you say so, I will. How are you doing at this one? Take a moment, one through ten, rate yourself. How do you do at this? 
Do you land well? Do you routinely say, because you say so, I will? Are you obedient on a regular basis? I see a bias fraction test. I say a, I see a will you follow direction test. Write this one down. I see a who deserves the credit test. Who deserves the credit? Now, now once you've written that, I want you to look up at me, okay? I want you to put on your, what I call your holy imagination caps. And I want you to think with me for a minute, okay? When does Jesus come up with this idea about the miracle of the fish? When does it happen? More importantly, why is Jesus going to do a miracle with fish? I mean, if I put on my holy imagination cap, I can come up with a few reasons. He looked at these old boys, and they're tired. They've been fishing all night long. <laughs> I'm going to do something for them, all right? I'm going to give them a bunch of fish. I, he could have done it for that reason. Or maybe, maybe he thought to himself, man, you want to talk about closing out a sermon, Will? Why don't we do it with a big miracle at the end, right? Let all the people on the shore see all the fish. He could have done it for that. But see, what I want to tell you is that when I put on my holy imagination, I say, when did he think about this and why? I think maybe he's setting up a test. And I call that test the who deserves the credit test. And it's a test that you and I take all the time as well. So if you're going to understand this, you've you, you got to see how this works. You've got to get the image. He says, put out in the water. They put out in the water. They drop the nets and boom, the whole boat shakes. They start bringing on fish. Call the other boats, bringing on fish. They're taking in so many fish. I mean, if you really could see what was happening here, I can't even describe it to you. At first, they were probably startled, and then they're probably overjoyed, and then they're probably high-fiving one another because this is money. Money's pouring into these boats. These are fishermen. They're going to sell these fish. They've got money coming their way. This is exciting. This is big. But when they're doing all their high five and they're bringing all the fish in, the boats are about to sink. You don't miss Peter. Because all of them are busy. What's the Bible tell us about Peter? It says Peter fell at Jesus' knees. He said, go, 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 go away from me. I'm a sinful man. You see, I think what's going on here is that Peter knows this ain't them. This ain't them. That somebody else deserves the credit for this catch of fish. It sure ain't them. They've never seen something like this before. They've never seen boats fill up with fish like this. This is otherworldly. This is a miracle. And he recognizes it. And he's kneeling down at the feet of Jesus. And a catharsis, a life change is happening in his soul. Let me pause here for a moment and just remind you of something. We struggle, you and me, can we be honest? We struggle at the who deserves the credit test. Part of our human nature is we love to take the credit. If we come up with an, 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 an idea and it goes well, right? Oh, how smart are we, right? Not that maybe God led us to that and that God gave us wisdom and knowledge and gave us direction. We are so good at taking the credit. And by the way, this happens in churches. In churches, God does good things and people take the credit for it. In families, God does good, good things and people take the credit for it. And what I'm suggesting to you is that we need to take note of Peter because there's a test going on here and he ain't taking no credit for these fish. He's kneeling down in front of Jesus and he is seeing that this is a work of Jesus this is a miracle of Jesus. He is not going to take the credit. And the question that I would have for you is, how good at that are you? I mean, do you in your family and in your business, do you routinely just point to God and say, look at God. God did that. God did that. Look, God did that. Is that who you are? Because, see, I think that's the kind of followers God's looking for. People who don't take credit. But people who point to God and say, look what he did. Look what he did. Look what he did. By the way, how you doing at that one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How you doing at the who deserves the credit test? I got to go a little bit faster, okay? Just two more. One more test I would call is the grander vision test. The grander vision test. 
And this is a big one, the grander vision. These boys are in the boat. They're having a blast. It's exciting if you really knew what was going on. I mean, this is, whoa! This is a life change moment for these guys. Now, what's Jesus doing? I mean, maybe, you, maybe your image of Jesus is he's standing on the edge of the boat, you know, with some halo. Oh, do you really think that's who Jesus is? I, what I want to say to you is I think Jesus is in the thick of it. I think Jesus is having a blast with these boys. I think he's high-fiving with them. I think he's helping them pull in the nets. I think Jesus is like, wow! And we're there seeing, you know, big money, right? We're there seeing fish, and they love fish. They fish all the time. I think Jesus is seeing something else. And I, can, can you just imagine kind of how this happened? I mean, can't you see Jesus going, wow, right here with these guys? Guys, look at this! Pulling in, look at it! And then can't you see a little shift happening? And Jesus is going, hey guys, hey guys, hey guys. It's fish. But what? What if? What if? What if we call people like this every day for God? What if? You see, what he's doing is giving, giving them a grander vision test. Now, let me be very clear what he's not doing. Jesus isn't shaming them. He's not saying, oh, you know, if you choose to stay a fisherman, I'll be off doing grand, you know, global kingdom things, and oh, you'll just be on a lake. He's not doing that. What he's actually doing is very different from that. He's telling them that their profession can inform them about the kingdom. And by the way, he does this all the time. He wants us to understand and see beyond what we do with our daily lives and our professions and see how it can have a kingdom impact. You know, you, right here in this church, we've got all kinds of people in all kinds of professions. We've got attorneys and teachers and nurses and doctors. We've got all kinds of people. We've got people doing small engine repair and auto shop stuff. We got all, but the question is, how well you, do you do at maintaining a grander vision for what you do? I'm going to brag on my wife for a minute. My wife's a teacher. She's been teaching a good long time. And about every day, she comes home with a story of her children. And it's not always easy stories. It's, it's oftentimes about what they're doing and how they're doing developmentally and where they're going. But can I just tell you that my wife, I think, does a really good job, as I bet a lot of teachers in this room do, at being able to remember the impact she's having on those young, young lives. And so what I want to say to you is this is so important that you have a grander vision for wherever you are. I mean, is it about dollars? Or is it about destinies? Because that day Jesus is looking at those boys and all they're thinking about is dollars. But Jesus gives them a grander vision, a vision of destinies. And how they can leverage what they do to make it a kingdom impact. You know, what I want to say to you is God gives this, he wants his disciples to have this kind of thing all the time. I, I was working on this message this week and thinking about this. And I was reminded of a time a couple of years ago when, when my son, Andrew, was, was uh, graduating from Emory University. And my wife looked at me and said, you, Andrew needs some suits. He needs some suits. And so, uh, Andrew, we, we went to a suit store to get suits. Now, that's, that's, that's kind of commonplace, isn't it? Just to go get some suits. And we walked in, and I asked a guy for help. And I'll never forget this guy. His name's Fred. Because Fred, Fred, oh, Fred was something else. I said, Fred, can you help us? I said, this is my son, Andrew, and we, we're trying to come in here today, maybe buy one, two, three suits or something. He don't have a suit, and, he, and we need a suit. And he looked at Andrew, and he said, my goodness, what a good-looking young man. Walked over and put his hands on Andrew's shoulders, and he said, you look like a 42 regular, strong, tall, and handsome. How'd you get so good-looking? <laughs> How do you answer that, by the way? <laughs> he looked at Andrew and he said, We're going to come with me, come with me, come with me. We're going to go find just what you need. And as they walked through the store, he said, Now, why do you need a suit? And Andrew said, Well, I just graduated. I'm about to graduate from Emory University. He stopped him. Oh, you've got a brain, then, don't you? You've got a brain. You're a smart boy. 
And I faded into the dang background. I did. I just sat there and watched Andrew and Fred go back and forth with one another. And Andrew said, well, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing some interviews, and I'm thinking about doing this and thinking about that. And, and, but I'm worried about this. And worried about that. I'll never forget Fred. He just stopped Andrew, and he said, you know what I learned a long time ago? Andrew, I learned that you do your part, and you let God do his part. Guys, I remember Fred this week. Because I always want to remember Fred. Fred wasn't selling suits. Matter of fact, I went and asked about it. Fred was on salary. He didn't make a dollar. We bought three suits that day. Fred didn't make a dollar. Because Fred wasn't working on dollars. Fred was working on destinies. And he had a grander vision for what he was doing. Not suits. Lives. How are you doing it then? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How are you doing it? The grander vision of what God has given to you. And then finally, last one, write this one down. And I know I ain't got enough space there because it's a long sentence, okay? But I call this test the Will I leave it behind if he asks me to? Test. Will I leave it behind if he asks me to? Test. Now, you know the story. They're able to get the boats back to the shore. And then Jesus looks at them and he says, come and follow me. And the Bible says, and they drop their nets and they, that's Simon, James, and John, who would eventually become the three closest friends of Jesus. They dropped their nets and they left everything. Pastor Stephen, what do you, what do you mean by I left everything? I don't even know all that that means. I don't. I just know that that day, I remember as a young Christian reading that scripture right there. I just thought, man, I'm amazed at how that day they left their nets, they left their old world behind, and they walked into a new plan that God had for them to follow Jesus. That's the test of a disciple. And when I think about that, I think about that a couple different ways. I think about that like people like me who are vocationally called to ministry, because they left everything, and that was their new thing, right? By the way, did you know this church has a culture and a history of people in this church answering the call of God to just leave it all behind and go do vocationally the work of God? I mean, it's way more than just, you know, Bishop Billy Cannon. I was in our atrium the other day with Zach Townsend, who many of you may not even know. He's one of my clergy colleagues today. He said, Pastor Stephen, do you know that it was in these walls, these very walls, that I answered the call to ministry? This church has a culture of call, and I always wanted to have a culture of call, and maybe God's calling you. But maybe it's also more than that. Because in some ways, isn't that the test that every disciple has to make? Will you leave it behind? Will you leave your hopes and your plans? Will you leave all your dreams and all your aspirations? I have a better life for you, believe it or not. But will you trust me? Will you leave that behind? Yes, it does look like leaving your shame and your guilt and your problems behind. Will you trust me enough to leave it behind? By the way, real quickly, how are you doing at that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How are you doing at the will you leave it all behind if he asks you to? Well, I've gone too long, and we've got Holy Communion. But can I just pause for just a moment? Just kind of recap. The test of followership. The bias for action test. I think God wants people who want to go. The will you follow direction test. We wouldn't know Peter if he said no. The who deserves the credit test. The grander vision test. And then this last one, maybe the biggest one, will you leave it all behind if he asks me to? Hey, church, today we're coming to celebrate Holy Communion. I just want, I want you to remember something. He left it all behind for you. The Bible says he left the comfort and the pleasures and the beauty of heaven to come and redeem you. He left it all behind because he knew you. And he died a gruesome death on a cross because he loves you. And if you're here today and you've never become a follower, there's no better day than today. God invited you to this very place for this very moment. Will you 
Leave it all behind if he asks you to. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, what we call a disciple, it's a big step. It's a hard step. But it's the best choice you'll ever make. I pray you make that decision today. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the stories in the Bible that just come to life for us and they remind us about who we are to be and how we are to live. And God, we just ask you even this week, help us to walk and see these tests all around us. But most importantly, God, for the person today who would trust you for the very first time to say, yes, I will leave it all behind. I pray that today you would bring salvation and forgiveness into their life, that you'd write their name in the Lamb's book of life, and that the day they would feel in their spirit that they have come to life and that they have eternity because they are now a disciple and a follower of you. Thank you, Jesus, for grace and salvation, full and free. Thank you for forgiving us. And thank you for putting us on mission as followers of you. We pray this in your most holy name. Amen.